Now on the Business Radio X Network, it's the Self-Aware Leader Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Self-Aware Leader Podcast, where we sit down twice a month with successful executives and talk to them about their leadership philosophies, how they have risen to high levels of success, and how they are now leveraging their Enneagram power to continue their growth journeys. I am your host, Linda John, executive coach and certified Enneagram practitioner, and we are broadcasting from the Tucson Business Radio X studios located in the Stewart Title Company building on Broadway Boulevard in sunny Tucson, Arizona. Ruth Getz is my special guest for today's Self-Aware Leader podcast. Ruth is a former Wisconsin tourism executive and solopreneur from Northern Wisconsin. Since retiring from her 30-year career as a regional tourism consultant for the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, Ruth has combined her passion for tourism with her business leadership skills to continue to positively impact tourism-based businesses and organizations in Wisconsin. I have invited Ruth to join us today on the Self-Aware Leader podcast to tell us more about her post-retirement business ventures, as well as her experiences with the Enneagram as she participated in our coaching programs earlier this year. Welcome, Ruth. Hi, Linda. Thanks for having me. This is an excellent idea to talk about the things that um, you have provided through the Enneagram and how it's impacted myself and my future. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so honored to have you as my guest. Now, you are retired from a highly successful career with the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, where you were a regional tourism consultant for 30 years. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about that experience in a little bit. It was after your retirement from that role that you became a solopreneur and launched your own business called Gets and Company. And then you found yourself supporting new business ventures along with longstanding tourism organizations. So I'm curious, what was your primary inspiration for your post-retirement business ventures? And what advice would you give to others who would like to pursue their own dreams after retirement? Well, Linda, what a great question. I guess um, when you work for an organization for 30 years, you learn a lot of skills and you know when the time is right to move on. And so after 30 years, and my age was conducive, I mean, it all worked. So um, I wanted to retire and try some things on my own. I think um, you have a lot of opportunities when you live in a small rural part of the world. I live in northern Wisconsin that you can really invest in people, invest in their projects and become um, a real catalyst to success for other people. And that, that's what drives me. Um, tourism, as you well know, is in my blood, in my DNA, if you will. Yeah. And um, I love small business. I love creative people. I love the whole concept of what vacations and getting away from the grind of daily life can do for people and their spirit and their opportunities to really be su- more successful if they get away. So um, I guess what I wanted to do was still be engaged, but be engaged on my own time. Mm -hmm. be engaged in my own um, perspective realities and to have some free time for myself. My job was very intense. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think at some point in your life when you're, you know, your job becomes more than what you really can handle, you need to back away and become a better um, Mm -hmm. example of uh, being creative, but yet still having a balance in your life. So um, I guess long and short answer is, Um, I wanted to really help people, but I wanted to do it with my own space and my own time. Yeah, some freedom built in there and some independence. And, you know, I exactly. Yeah, I suppose you've met so many people in a 30 year career in tourism uh, that you had probably developed these friendships and business relationships along the way. Is that a lot of where you decided to invest your projects and your energies and resources after your retirement? 
Well, what I saw is that, you know, again, we're in a small business environment and people don't always have the resources. And you know, as well as I do, banks and lending institutions just don't feel comfortable with the tourism industry. They like the job creation, they like the sustainability. And, you know, tourism is a fluctuating business. And so there's there peaks and valleys of tourism. And so I wanted to be um, kind of thinking outside the box. One of the investments, if I can share this example, which I think I'm really proud of is um, the this little gal who worked at a gift store in Bayfield, and Bayfield's an iconic tourism destination in northern Wisconsin. Um, she had the opportunity to um, buy the business from her, her employer, okay. and she didn't have the resources. She couldn't go to a bank and get that, so I said, okay, I'll invest in you, and what was problematic is we don't have a tourism season in the winter, so what I did is I said, let's do a loan program where you pay me when you have the money in the summer and in the winter you just pay me back what you can and no no lender's going to do that no Uh, bank you can't see anything like that so what i saw was a creative way to help people develop a business and i also you know i mean i got money my money back i got interest but i was able to create something that worked for her and um, she's paid me off she's now her own business owner it's a real huge success story and i success story and i'm proud to be a part of that that is such a great success story. And, you know, it does go to show how you can make your own terms, follow your passions, invest in projects that you believe in, and mm-hmm. still make money while helping others. I mean, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. It's sort of the angel investor, you know, philosophy where you want to help people. I mean, you don't, I put it, I put aside you know, the money that I knew that I could help support people with. And that's the money that I used. And so, you know, from that perspective, I was able to do a lot of different things. As some people pay me back, then I could help others. So, well, that's um, great. Yeah. It gets replenished. Nice philosophy. Exactly. Yeah, that is just great. So if you're um, applying your success in your post-retirement businesses, if you're going to take those main philosophies or key success factors and advise somebody else on how to, how to pursue their own dreams after retirement, what would be your top three things you would tell them? First, you have a, have a passion for what you want to do. You have to be, um, you have to be capable of assuming some risk. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not a stock market kind of risk. It's a personal involvement with, you know, your own finances and other people. And I think you just want to be, um, I I think you want to, you want to do some good. You want to help people. You have to have that passion for being out there to, to support people that, um, you trust Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're going to be successful, but, um, you just, it, you know, there's, there's this whole philosophy, the joy of giving and you're not, you're yeah. giving support. You're not giving them money. You, you want them to work for it. You want them to be to pay you back. But um, mm-hmm. it's that whole joy of seeing success. And you can't, yeah. you can't really buy that. There's no monetary value you can put on watching somebody, you know, build a business and become successful. <laughs> and you can relish in their, in their joy and happiness. So, yeah. so win, win, win. I can't say any more sure about is. that. That's so great. Well, let's talk a little bit about your 30-year career with the Wisconsin Department of <laughs> Tourism. You were a regional tourism consultant for that time, and it was during this time that you and I first met, going back quite a ways. And <laughs> it was clear to me all the way back when I first met you that you were doing your passion work. Tell us more about what your role was within the tourism industry and how you stayed motivated for 30 years doing that. Well, it started, I moved to... Um, Ashland, Wisconsin, from Phoenix, Arizona, which was quite the move. And I did not have a a position. So um, northern Wisconsin, there's, you know, there's almost two Wisconsins. There's northern Wisconsin, and then there's southern Wisconsin. And the tourism department at that time, this is 1977, um, 
was pretty much housed in Madison and supported the Dells in Milwaukee and some of the major Door County, some of the major tourism destinations in the state. But sure. um, there was a group of individuals who wanted to see more tourism development up along the shores of Lake Superior, which um, I moved to, which is Ashland. And um, so there was a pilot program that um, was started through the Upper Great Great Lakes Regional Commission to support tourism development. I mean, okay. Lake Superior, the Apostle Islands. So um, we started an office. It was a one-term interim office. And after that, um, it was just an ongoing opportunity to really support tourism and tourism businesses. And it really helped them feel like they were part of the state of Wisconsin to have kind of a branch outreach office. And for 30 uh, years, it expanded into other counties and into other um, opportunities, but um, basically um, the passion for tourism and what it brings for the local business community and what it brings for the, the visitors is, is really an exciting opportunity to be involved in. And so um, yeah. for 30 years, I had the passion for it. And, you know, it was just a, a really important way to build business, build an economic value and to support people that were, um, I think, really trying to develop something that was good for the local community. So well, it, it was sounds, a great job. It sounds really similar in some ways to what we were just talking about in your post-retirement career and your uh, angel investing in the tourism industry. Um, you, you have a passion for travel and for the visitors and the small businesses. Uh, you were helping them with how to be successful. And then you were realizing their success, they're watching them realize it, and that brought you great joy. I mean, it sounds like a similar recipe in a way. Well, it was an ideal job for me, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, working for the government has its pitfalls, but I think bottom line, I was a remote office, so I was away from the day-to-day -day operations of the office in Madison. And, you know, one thing I'm really proud of, Linda, is that I started as an individual, one person doing a tourism development role. Now there are five people in this same position that I started, what, 30, 30 44 years ago, and wow. now there's five people doing what I do throughout the state. And I think the value mm -hmm. of what we bring and they bring now to the tourism industry has, has been um, validated because I think yeah. all the, all the chambers and the tourism businesses recognize that this kind of liaison role between the department and the, the uh, businesses is very valuable. So yeah, I'm proud it's of that. Of, yeah, you should be. It's, it, it's as if the concept that, started with your remote office, paid dividends to the tourism industry and stakeholders and such that they decided to create similar positions in other parts of the state as exactly. well. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. yeah, you know, it was a vision that one of the leaders of the Department of Tourism back then had that we needed to have more on the ground kind of- in Boots the, on the ground. In, boats on the ground, community liaison services, which, when you were in your previous position, we worked very closely worked together. Very so, yes. you know, bottom line, we were there. We were the eyes and ears of the industry that we could relate back to. And, and outreach in government, I think, is critical, you know? Yeah, it really is. Get, it's sort of that glue. I mean, it can just be this big office in Madison that you don't really understand or know the people. Right. And it's that glue, that connector of those programs and those people with the day-to-day stakeholders that are out there exactly visitors yeah. to their businesses and, their and, and government can be intimidating and when you're you know you can sit across from somebody in a chamber office or at their bar or in their restaurant and you can talk and listen i mean listen is mm -hmm. probably the most important component of any any uh, relationship you have with people and listen to their concerns and their problems and you know really care about them and take it back and then have solutions and it's yeah, a very it's creative way to, to yeah. see success yeah those personal relationships just bring that other dimension you know the caring and the connecting of this is what you're trying to accomplish this is the right program for you and so it really is uh, a deeper one-on-one -on -one experience as opposed to just here's the department of tourism, here's the programs, figure out what you need, you know, it's going exactly. Deeper. Yeah. yeah. So well, the success I think of what I was able to accomplish was just that, you know, you, I think the key to, to proper communication is listening. Yeah. You have to listen first before you can even 
have any kind of awareness. So yeah, instead of just saying skill you have to acquire. Yeah. Instead of just saying we've got these 25 programs, (laughs) it's listening to what is going on in that community or with that business and saying these are two specific programs that might work for you. Exactly. Listening to what they need. Wow. She sounds so simple, but sometimes yeah. easily forgotten. <laughs> well, exactly. you're so humble. I know that you weren't, wouldn't bring this up on your own. So I'm going to do this. And it is a testament to the good work you did for decades for Wisconsin tourism. And at the culmination of your career, you were honored by over 1,000 tourism industry professionals at the Wisconsin Governor's Conference on Tourism when they awarded you the Lifetime Tourism Legacy Award. It says so much about your leadership abilities and congratulations. I was there that night. It was a very special night, I know. So what would you say is the secret sauce to your success? Oh, thank you, Linda. It was a special night, and it was the first Legacy Award that they established, so that meant a lot to me. I think, you know, I I mentioned it a little earlier, is just, you know, really caring, being passionate, and listening. And um, bottom line is that um, I really enjoyed what I did, and I really enjoyed the people that I worked and um, it never felt as a job that I had to go to. It was more of, you know, something that um, I knew that I was making a difference. I knew that I was people. And, you know, I had a degree in social work. And so um, I realized at a young age that I wasn't going to be a very good social worker. But um, <laughs> I kind of used it um, as my, yeah. I kind of used it as my way to help support tourism businesses. So um, that might be, <laughs> you know, just a inner, inner soul kind of thing. So what perfect. Do you think? What a great use of a social worker degree, working with the tourism industry professionals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love exactly. <laughs> um, Ruth, one of your hallmark traits that I've seen throughout the years is your willingness to share your, that you share your time, you share your expertise. Um, and, and a lot of times you do that as a volunteer and often on tours and boards of directors. And in fact, you did serve, um, you and I both served at the same time for some of this, but you were a member of the <laughs> Wisconsin Governor's Council on Tourism, as well as other tourism destination boards. What was it about these roles that motivated you to give so much and to serve? Well, um, again, I think it's just because... Um, I felt comfortable in being involved in these organizations. I knew their value. Um, basically, just knowing that um, I could make a difference. I and you know, um, a lot of people don't want to step up to the leadership role, and so they say, "Ask somebody who's really busy, and they'll do it." So I guess the more that I got involved in these organizations, the more that people would ask me, and I I felt I had the capacity to do it. Um, I also had a very understanding husband who felt that my role in all these things was valuable. I don't have any children, so I didn't have that kind of, you know, situation, family life, so that I did have the time, and I just like engaging in those kinds of things. But um, ultimately, um, when you're passionate, you just want to stay engaged and stay involved and stay motivated, so... It sounds like a big part of it for you is also that higher cause and doing good work for a cause. Exactly. Because um, you can, when you're involved and you can be the leader of something, I was president always of the, every organization, you can affect change. Yeah. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a really nice role to be in. So you can see things grow, see things happen, see success. And I, um, you know, there's motivation behind that. Oh, that that is so great. Now, how many years did you actually serve on the Wisconsin Governor's Tourism? I was Council? there for four years. You were there for four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And was it all all with the same governor? Did you serve multiple governors? I served, I think, under two. Governor Doyle and Governor Walker, just for a year under Governor Walker. And then it okay. just, you know, it's a long drive to Madison. And so at some point, I think my term was up and I just felt that it was time for somebody else to serve it. But um, just not to be um, 
I'll just to say what happened. I was the first tourism employee, former tourism employee, that oh. was also on the governor's council. So that's sort of a oh, interesting right. situation. So to yeah. go from an employee to then <laughs> being the advisory body that managed the organization right. was kind of an interesting perspective. Kind of seen, you know, right? on both sides it of was. the situation. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, um, it was. As mentioned early, earlier, you've been very busy since retiring 14 years ago. Tell us about some more of the investments and projects with which you've been committing your resources. Well, when I started my company, Getson Company, the primary um, motivation was that, that I just still had more to give and I wanted to be my own boss, if you will. So mm -hmm. what I did was I uh, acquired clients and it was more of a you know client relationship, but my one of my most successful client relationships was with Big Top Chautauqua, which is an, an entertainment venue in northern Wisconsin. And I served um, in that capacity as a consultant and a fundraiser. Mm. So um, for seven years, I worked as a fundraiser for Big Top Chautauqua, raising a lot of money. To help support the venue, entertainment, sponsorships, um, all sorts of things. And so um, I just retired from that position about, oh, two weeks ago. So that was a, a huge commitment for me. And then um, I've had other relationships with businesses where um, I've just become, you know, a, a kind of a liaison in marketing mm -hmm. and um, in fundraising and sales. Um, so you just pick and choose clients that you'd like to work with. It gives you an opportunity to be engaged, make some additional resources, you know, yes. and then um, just pick and choose the times when you want to work. And um, it's been kind of fun just to have something, you know, that gives you um, a reason to, you know, get up in the morning and be engaged and have some resources. But it's not a huge commitment from a, you know, nine to five situation. So. And right now I have three clients, Okay. Or, excuse me, four clients. And, um, you know, I pick and choose the people that I want to work with because I'm passionate about their product and what they're selling and what they're doing for other people. And it's um, a very nice way to get engaged with companies that you feel comfortable with and you can, you know, pretty much pick and choose what works for you. So it seems that they all have some tie to tourism in the end. I've, I've, I've heard you talk about some restaurant partners, some gift shop, some attractions big, with Big Top, some tourism organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to all center in that space, though, with your I, Yeah, I think they do. I think you need to stay with something that you're, you're uh, familiar with, that you can articulate about the successes. Um, the restaurants that I've been involved in and I'm done with that, but again, angel investing yeah. in restaurants and bars that, you know, again, people that really wanted to develop their passion, didn't have the resources. And so um, that's something I've done for the last 14 years. And mm -hmm. um, my last uh, project, I completed that about so six months ago. So okay. now um, based on everything in the economy and where we are with the COVID and, you know, the situation with small businesses and tourism, I'm not going to be involved in too much more of that just yeah. because I think, um, you know, I was fortunate to get out before COVID became a real, um, devastating impact on our small businesses. And so, um, you know, I may, um, get back into that, but right now I think that's something that I'm going to try to steer away from until we get a better sense of where tourism is, is going. So. Right. Right. Yeah. The tourism industry and those small businesses have taken the brunt of the impacts of the global pandemic. And it's just um, so sad to see. Uh, it is. And I know you and I both love supporting these small businesses and local restaurants and taverns and shops and really doing our part to keep that tourism cycle going. So I know you'll join me when we say we are hoping for the best in all of them surviving and thriving um, as soon as things get going with the vaccine and that type of thing as well. Yeah, I feel right now my, my number one client is the Cable Area Chamber of Commerce. 
again, it's in my blood, but um, mm. I, I have con I'm working with them, consulting them, being a tourist in tourism information specialist for that organization. And um, it's a small town in northern Wisconsin, about 1,000 people, and um, a major tourism destination for biking, oh, yeah. cross-country skiing, for fishing. Yeah. It's a great, you know, I have to say we've done relatively well this summer because that's the kind of product people wanted. They wanted to get away. They wanted to go to a cabin. They yep. wanted to be somewhere else, but they didn't want to be in that, you know, major social environment. So we were, we have had a excellent summer. Our fall has been okay. okay. So, um, but um, you know, those small businesses are struggling right now. Right. Um, there aren't a lot of people around. There aren't a lot of people going out to dine. And um, yes. it, it, it just wrenches my heart when I see businesses that have to shutter because of, you know, the pandemic. And it's, um, I think if you think of Linda, you're right. Of all the industries that have had, you know, significant demise because of the pandemic, it has been our tourism industry. It really yeah. has. And it's a, uh, that's a very difficult thing for all these businesses that we've worked so hard. I mean, you have, and I have, and all of us have worked so hard right. to help promote support and, yeah. you know, it's through no fault of their own. Right. Exactly. Struggling right now. And at the same it's time, very painful. Yeah. You, you mentioned this earlier and, and it is where I put my greatest optimism and hope is that people travel for many reasons the obvious mm -hmm. reasons of discovering new places, but it also is a way to rejuvenate and mental health, exactly. feeding your, your, your mental uh, state and that type of thing. So there will be, I'm guessing, predicting a pent up demand for travel that once things are safe again, people like, get ready because people are wanting to connect, wanting to get up wanting to gather in large groups for conventions and concerts and festivals. And, and absolutely. And you know, we, to, to reflect back on big top, which is that, um, mm -hmm. you know, entertainment venue under a tent, we didn't have a season this year. My last, my last year with big top and we didn't have any entertainment. And I think the pent up demand for entertainment, live music, getting out, just escaping, from exactly. reality and sitting in a sitting in a tent and watching Jackson Brown or Bonnie Raitt or oh yeah um, Joan Baez and we've had some of the most amazing artists up at the tent Brandy Carlisle you know yeah. we were supposed to have Tanya Tucker this year and oh. so you think about it so there mm -hmm. is that you're absolutely right Linda there's a demand to get away to lose your soul in something else I think more than ever, because I think we're all stressed to the max. We're all, Especially after you know, this year. Yes. <laughs> we all want to go back to some sense of normalcy. I don't know what that is anymore. I can't even define normalcy. No, but it'll some... be a new next normal is what they're calling it. Exactly. But, but when but... things start to get better, it will involve traveling and escaping, mm -hmm. as you said, and mm -hmm. reconnecting. It's the people part of it, too. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, your families, your friends, you haven't seen them for months mm -hmm. at a time. So it's all, so, you know, hopefully our businesses can survive till then. That's the sad part because they are not over the, the, um, end of, we don't, I don't know when the end will happen, when will the end will be, but, um, it'll redefine how we vacation, how we travel, how we experience. Yes. So absolutely. Good luck to us all. Yes, absolutely. So now we are getting ready to shift into our work together as you look <laughs> out your Enneagram type and strategies yep. that we've worked on to support your continued success. So when we come back from a short break, we will dig deep into more Enneagram discussions with Ruth Getz, tourism guru and solopreneur from Northern Wisconsin. And we will be right back. This podcast episode is sponsored by Linda John Consulting, and I'm speaking today with her. Tell me about Linda John Consulting, Linda, and why people are attracted to your business. 
You bet. Well, we are a coaching and consulting business. We have a wide array of services, including executive coaching, strategic planning, team development programs, um, really all focused on uh, individual leadership growth and uh, organizational development. And so at a time like now when times are tough and a lot of organizations are going through a lot of change, we have the services that can help people get back on track and really grow. Well, corporations report that executive coaching is a key to making their businesses thrive. What makes your coaching practice unique? And why would someone choose Linda John Consulting? Well, I love to use an assessment tool known as the Enneagram, which is a personality assessment, um, puts, puts people into nine different main types and teaches them integration strategies for how to be the best version of themselves. I do have a lot of uh, programs focused on other strategies as well, but this really is one of our key success strategies with Linda John Consulting and people really are seeing the benefits from this, these programs. Okay, Linda, so what are the best ways for people to contact with you? Best way is just to go to lindajohnconsulting.com and click on set up a consultation and we'll be back in touch and we'll get you started. We are visiting with Ruth Getz, tourism guru and solopreneur from Northern Wisconsin. Ruth, you and I coached together earlier this year's earlier this year, and that was taking place just as the realities of the global pandemic that we we're just talking about were starting to settle in for us. Uh, we did use the Enneagram Strengths-Based Assessment Tool to process how to survive and thrive during these challenging times. And now we are ready to hear more from you about that. So let's start with this. What is your Enneagram type? And what are your favorite features of your type? Wow. Well, I have to say, I want to preface what my type is with. Um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me with COVID. Linda and I did this right in March mm -hmm. when I was quarantined in my home, That's which right. I am a type one yes. social. And it was probably the worst thing that could have ever happened to me personally. So um, <sighs> the ex the exercise, the experience was I don't know, it was like almost life-saving, Linda, because it gave me a sense that you know, as we went through this process, I was still a human being with some sensitivities to all sorts of realities. And um, I mean, it's something none of us have ever gone through. Right. So, I mean, it couldn't have been more timely when we, when we did this. That's um, so great to hear. To learn, to learn about myself, um, I guess I'm a type one. And... Um, I'm also, you know, in an age where um, all my life experiences and the things that have happened to me have given me a great way to understand myself. But um, mm -hmm. what Linda and I did in this coaching process was to really um, fine tune the kind of person that I am. And, and um, I loved it because it gave me a sense of who I really am. It really de redefined um, what I thought about myself, but it was a really great yeah. process to um, determine just, you know, I am, I am who I think I am. And I yeah. am um, <laughs> capable of inter interacting with other people in a way that I thought I should be. Right. So um, I, I guess being a, a, a one is it's got a lot of wonderful qualities. It also has some pitfalls, which I learned more about from <laughs> Linda's process, which I think was very helpful to me. Yeah, I know it was very helpful. That's what's the best thing for me about the Enneagram in general is we just start from the context of type and that's sort of the box that we're in. But the whole idea is holding on to the best parts of our type um, stay in there and then figure out what are the challenges and getting out of our box by integrating into the gifts of the other types that we do have access to. And it was great to see you doing that and, and finding success. So we're going to hear a little bit more about some of those specific experiences. Um, first of all, the type one, the name for it is strict perfectionist. Do you resonate with that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was amazing. I mean, I would read, I read through, 
you know, you fill out this questionnaire and you do the best you can answering the questions. And then um, when Linda evaluated me, it was like, okay, that is me. <laughs> it was just like this aha moment, but um, I was happy with it. I thought, yeah, that Let that's me. who I am. Yeah. Um, my husband tells me that all the time. So he was happy. <laughs> I let him read the, 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 the uh, profile and he totally right on. Um, bottom line though. Uh, yeah, that's who I am. I mean, um, what I loved about the process again is that it wasn't it wasn't critical. It was yeah. really positive about who you are, but it gave you some sense of how you maybe some of your qualities may be a little stricter than you want and how to right. how to refine yourself. Right. You know, to be a perfectionist isn't isn't fun because you want to switch everybody around. You want everybody <laughs> to be like you. Because you're good at what you do. So why wouldn't everybody want to be who you are? That's, that's not healthy. So great. So. You know, that's another name. You're, you're hitting on another name that some people have for the type one, which is sort of that true north person, the, the gut knowing person, also mm -hmm. the improver. So it's like, you know what's right in the world. You just want to bring the rest of the world along with you. And sometimes they don't always want to come, but you know, this is where they need to go. So well, of course they need to go there. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. I also love what you said about your husband reading it in a green, because I think it's fun when people share the assessment reports, mm -hmm. their spouses, I always give them that option to do so themselves. Um, but, uh, sometimes it's the spouses feel a little bit redeemed in a way. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've known this about you all our lives. <laughs> I told exactly. you you were like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Very um, refreshing. Yeah, we hit on the uh, the whole thing about being a tool for self awareness that mm -hmm. is so powerful with the Enneagram. What do you remember? One impactful self awareness aha moment for you through this process, and how that? Oh, well, I think. I think what we just talked about is that. Um, you know, I, I guess I always felt everyone should be like me because yeah. I had a great life and I felt very integrated with who I was and yeah. how I, you know, approached life. And I thought, why won't people just do what I think is important in their lives? And what Linda's program does is it helps you understand other people that people are different. You know, it's an yeah. amazing thing. You know, we're all different people were based on our you know environment based on our genetics based on how we've lived our lives and True. um this whole process gives us a sense of we can be a one but we can have these wings that bring us into different types of situations and how we react to people who are different than we are um yeah it's such a powerful tool especially if you're a a, a manager your ceo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have your own company, you have employees, you really need to know about yourself first before yeah. you can really interact with other people. And I found it very, very powerful. And um, it gave me a sense of, okay, I'm a good person. I know what I'm doing, but I also, I think the most, if you ask me what, it, it's how I react to other people. The thing that was... Um, I guess I never realized that sometimes I can come across critical because I'm so sure about everything. <laughs> so when Linda said, you know, this is one of your situations, she didn't, she never criticizes me, but what she says is you need to be aware of this. This is an awareness factor. Yeah. So I have seen myself, I do come across, you know, critically, um, I guess, critically aware of that, you know, maybe you're not doing it the way I do it. So my, the way people perceive me is, is that I'm being critical when I don't mean to be critical. Right. I just want them to realize that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and they should do it my way. There's right and wrong. Exactly. <laughs> <You're doing> wrong. <laughs> yeah. And what you brought up earlier is so great too, because with the Enneagram and the nine Enneagram types, it's almost like you can see it as nine different windows to the world that people look through. Mm -hmm. And the way that you look through the window, that your, your window makes the world look different to you than the type two window or the type seven window. And so it is those different, and that's a big, that was a, one of my first ahas too, is that people really do look through different windows. 
to the And that's market. really important if you're in a management position right. because you can't, how do you get productivity out of people who don't see the window the way you right. do? You yeah. have to know, and I think what's really important in a, in a team setting is you need to know who your people are. You need to know what yeah. is their type. And you know, it's not a critical situation. It's just an awareness situation because you can't judge other people by their type. No, no. You have to but let them be help. who they need to be, but it helps you yeah. understand why they Same react to, to, you know, your authority, why they react to your, um, your messages, why they react to your, what commands that you'd like to see them and how, how do you ask people to do things for you when you're, they're your, your employee? I mean, how right. do they perceive you? You know, and if you're they asking, might, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you ask in the wrong way to the wrong, to the other person, yeah. you may never get the performance out of them that you want. So, so true. Now, if you were to ask a type five, the quiet specialist to share something verbally in a large room of people that that person's going to retreat, you know, exactly. they, they don't want to do that. Whereas a type three who likes to be the performer and, I'm, <laughs> they, you know, would be happy to stand up and share that. So you're right. Knowing the types of the people on the team can really give you an edge as a leader as well. So here's my pitch for this. Every company should have this process. <laughs> they should have an Enneagram process so that they can understand because they'll then get the maximum performance out of their employees. Uh, that's so kind of you, Ruth. And I know you've been doing a lot of promoting. You've sent some clients to me that I'm now working with, and it is it is pretty magical. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, when people first learn about themselves and then learn about each other and then put it all together and start pulling in the same direction as a team. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And I think the beauty of this program is this, it's not judgmental. It's no. allowing people to be who they need to be based right. on what their type is. Yes. And it's just trying to build a communication structure that everybody can be okay with who they are. Right. And, and a lot of that is done through the integration strategies that you mentioned earlier. Um, so let's talk about a couple of those uh, strategies with you. Now, the first thing that I wanted to point out based on what you said earlier is your, each type has one of three subtypes. It can be social or self-preservation or one-on-one. -on -one. And you wanna have those all in balance in, to, be, to ideally be able to grow and develop. So you have a really strong social subtype, which to me says a lot about your work in that higher cause space. Can you speak to that? Well, I think, you know, being a perfectionist, um, you also have to realize that, uh, which I, I think I've done, but Linda really, through this course has um, identified it, but I think you have to recognize that other people are different and you still want to be engaged. You yeah. know, I'm not the kind of person that's going to be introverted and say, okay, those people I can't deal with. So I'm just going to re retract into myself. So part of what my socialization, you know, situation is, is that I want to engage with people. I yeah. want to understand who they are. Right. I recognize in my own self that um, um, I, I have a type and I have a sensitivity and I have a value system, but other people can be different mm -hmm. and you still want to get to know them and understand them. And I, um, again, maybe this is my social work background, but you know, you have to recognize that everyone has a different, um, reflection on life yeah. and, um, they have their own style and they have their own situations. And, you know, and um, it also has to do with being older, you know, I'm, I'm approaching that big seven O and um, <laughs> you learn a lot through life's experiences. And so that has something to do with it. But right. I think the fact that I still want to be social, I still want to be engaged. I don't retreat, but yet I'm very confident and competent in myself. So right. it's a nice, yeah. it's an That's excellent right. place to be. That's I right. wish everybody could be here. <laughs> yeah. And you talked about how over time, <laughs> And developing strategies to deal with challenges through life and you know your report is um showing that you have a high level of integration already where you're already tapping many of the types i i think it's one of the highest 
reports I've seen as far as how highly integrated you are. And you really felt that was about life experience. That was how you explained that. And I, I think that makes some sense. I think I, I totally agree. I think this year though, um, like I said, Lynn and I did this in a really important place in, you know, what happened in 2020. I mean, it was, um, it couldn't have happened at a better time right. because it was a scary part of our world back then in March. Quarantine. Yeah. So much uncertainty. Yes. I mean, we've never been quarantined before in our lives exactly. and here we were, you know, and so it was like, just how can I get through this with who I am? Yes. <laughs> Excuse oh, me, yeah. and that was very, very valuable. Very valuable, and especially uh, as like I said, one. timing couldn't be perfect. More perfect. yeah, as a type type one, where you kind of know the world, you've got this down, and you have life experience. Like, and I'm oh, social. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, this situation, we do this, this, and all of a sudden, a global pandemic. What do I do? How do I act? And and you tell me to work from home and not go anywhere. <laughs> telling me that that was no like, way. oh. You know, put oh. me in jail and you are not a key. You are not a no. happy camper there. And so let's move into no. that. Type one has a line of stress. You had your experience in some of that, if I may add that. Mm -hmm. um, your line of stress tends to go to a type four, the intense creative. And at unhealthy levels of four, this can show up as an inner sadness and um, the strategy then is to try to stretch to the healthy level, um, which is more creative expression. How did you see that showing up for you while we were coaching? Well, that was, you know, I, I, I'm glad you identified that, but I think during this time, that was a really difficult thing. I mean, I had to realize that working from home, I still worked. I mean, I consulted with big top and, um, I had to find a way to make that, um, valuable to me you know because to me going to the office interacting with the staff that was all part of my relationship and so here i was sitting on the phone raising money right. trying to you know when we don't have a season and we're trying to develop new approaches to relevancy so right. um, i had to it was a struggle mm -hmm. i mean it was a struggle to feel relevant and mm -hmm. so you had to you had to refocus you yeah. had to say okay pull that inner strength and um yeah. Uh, you know, the Enneagram gave me a sense that it was there. It just right. wasn't where I hadn't tapped that resource before because I didn't have to. Right. So exactly. recognizing that it was part of what I, I had, it was part of who I could be. I just yes. had to figure it out how to do it. It was it, so. naturally how you're wired. That feeling that you had, that deep sorrow mm -hmm. about what was going on in the world was very much the way that you're wired as a type one that goes to a a four under stress. Um, and I remember but if I hadn't known, Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. If I hadn't known that about myself, if I hadn't had the, you know, the survey and understood where my, all my wings were and the things, the things that were important. Um, I don't think I would have been able to, to cope with the COVID as well as I did. Yeah. So, yeah. H having that awareness, like this is, mm -hmm. not, this is what, uh, what happens and instead of being like what is going on I don't like this feeling but being able to sit with that pain and even then strategy of stretching to that more creative side um you got you got pretty creative speaking of creativity you got pretty creative about <laughs> how you were going to get out safely and still stay connected with your friends and um social connections I, I remember I did that, that happening <laughs> yeah I I, I, I well, I, I did. I mean, again, this is just unprecedented what we've been through. Right. So you had, you know, you had to recognize the safety factor and still being engaged. And, you know, in the summer, I was able to be outside. I could do the things that I wanted to do, see friends, mm -hmm. um, do takeout, sit outside mm -hmm. in a, you know, uh, outdoor dining environment. But yeah. um, I, I just think, you know, um, the whole concept that I can be okay through this and the process that, um, the Enneagram process that let me understand who I was, was very, very effective in, um, yeah. just recognizing that, you know, we can do this. And I, all I can say is that I think for anybody who really wants to have a successful business, a, a successful relationship with their staff, um, this is a process that really you should undertake because it, it gives you the strengths to feel good about yourself first 
and then how you interact with other people. So it really gives you confidence and um, it gives you a framework and a language, a vocabulary that doesn't make things seem as personal. And they, it's, it's like easier mm -hmm. to explain what's going on through this framework that is not, you know, critical or anything like that. It's just, it is what it is. So, um, and it allows people to be who they are. Yeah. You know, it's okay right. to be different. I mean, that's the hardest thing for me. Being a perfectionist, you just know that you're right and everybody should be like you. But if you can <laughs> recognize that people are okay being different than you. Yeah. You know, that's okay. in, in all this political thing that we're going through. That's probably been the most effective thing for me is to understand people will see the same thing differently and that's okay. And it's not even okay. It's beautiful. It's what makes the world. Exactly. And it makes it beautiful. So that's great. I happen to know that you love to travel and we have that common connection. <laughs> I also know that you love the sanctuary on the lake that you've created for yourself in Northern Wisconsin. Tell us more about that paradox and how you think your Enneagram type might play into that. Well, um, I think I have the best of both worlds, um, mm -hmm. being able to really isolate, you know, especially this in this situation on a beautiful home on a great lake, but mm -hmm. uh, also that I, I, you know, I still will travel. I still will um, escape from, you know, the situation that I have. Um, yeah. I, I, I believe in travel. I think it's good for the soul. I think it's good for the mind. I think escapism is great. Um, take a good book and sit on the beach and yes. just enjoy the day. Those are very vital to your overall healthy, successful life. Yeah. So I yeah. believe in that, that. You know, if we explain that through the Enneagram, I remember you um, connecting with this, that line of release for the type one goes to the healthiest version of the type seven, which is the enthusiastic visionary. They are a little bit more playful, positive, joyful, relaxed with their rules. Um, does that connect for you? But that's you only on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go on a mini vacation, right? In your backyard. Yeah, too. I can. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you I, get, I guess what I like about the whole process is that I really like what Linda determined I was. Or yeah, I am. I mean, I have all the right, you know, the right situations. And um, yeah, I think just being joyful and playful and um, recognizing that that's okay too. Because being a perfectionist is very, very difficult sometimes. And yeah, so to be able to have an outlet, have an outlet for playfulness yeah. is exactly. very, yeah. very appropriate. It, very exactly. healthy. Very yeah. healthy. For type one, it's kind of giving themselves permission to just let their hair down, mm -hmm. not be so hard. And the other thing about type one is people think that they're judging others and really they're right. they're really hard on themselves. They're really their own self-critic as much as anything else as well. Yeah. And you know, I guess that's that's what the process really identified for me is that how I come across to other people, that's mm. really important. Mm -hmm. Um I didn't realize that sometimes I'm, I come across critical. I just thought I was coming across with, um, this is a behavior that seems to make sense and you can be more successful if you follow this behavior. But if people are in a different perspective, they're not going to see it that way. Right. And that was a really important revelation to me is just yeah. how am I perceived by other people? And um, I know on page 22 of my report, it said <laughs> that people sometimes see me as being critical. Wow. That was a real <laughs> eye opener. So Yeah, because you don't realize that you're coming no. across that way necessarily. No. I've, I've talked to a lot of type eights who the eights are the um, active controller or the challenger and they have the same issue where they don't realize how they're coming across. They um, sometimes can be very intimidating to others. And every time that I've talked to an eight about that, they have no idea, no idea that they're coming across that way. So um, it, it is interesting how that and it exactly. holds a mirror up to ourselves and it allows us to take a look, a, a peek inside of like, what, what's, well, how am I showing up to the rest of the world? And do I like that or do I want to tweak that? So, yeah. But um, it's not, and I think you, 
I, I just think you said it before. It's not judgmental. It's no. just, this is who you are. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the beauty of it. Cause it doesn't make you feel bad. It doesn't right. it's just an awareness, an awareness about yourself that maybe if I had it 30 years ago, I might've done things differently. I don't know, but, um, I am where I am now. So you are. And like you said, over that period of time, you likely were developing strategies. Clearly you're already tapping into a lot of the other types because you're showing up as a highly integrated individual at this point. Yes. You, you have a dominant type in the, your main type one, but we all have all nine types in us. And so the beauty of all of this is being able to take the gifts of each of them and show up as integrated as possible. And you're doing a great job of that. Exactly. And thank you. Thank One you. One thing we didn't talk about yet were your wings. And um, I'm going to remind you that as a type one, you have a friend on each side of your type, the type nine and the type two are your wings. So the nine is the adaptive peacemaker. And I feel like your work as a consultant and working with multiple stakeholders and different viewpoints probably came into play there for you. Does that resonate for you? Yeah, it does. I think just trying to make sure, um, you know, soften your internal tensions and try yeah. to be more respectful of um, other people's issues that, you know, that right. does make sense to me. Yes. Yeah. And then the two I know shows up for you really strong. The type two wing is your considerate helper. And, you know, anyone that works in the tourism industry for 30 years and then invests in small businesses for another 14 years has the considerate helper wing strong at play. Yes, it does. And uh, again, you know, having those understandings of, you know, um, the softness, how it softens you a little bit from your perfectionism is um, very helpful. But yeah, I, I do want to help people. I do want to be supportive. And yeah, it, it all makes sense once you figure out who you really are. Wow. So great talking with you, Ruth. Um, it, I'm guessing that there might be a listener out there that wants to connect with you and maybe chat a little bit more about your Enneagram experience or your angel investing program. <laughs> How would you like our listeners to connect with you? They can just um, email me at uh, my email address, which is ruthiegets.69 at gmail.com. That's great. So that's Ruthie, R-U-T-H-I-E, gets, G-O-E-T-Z, dot six nine at gmail.com. Ruth, Perfect. I want to thank you so much for being my special guest today. Ruth Getz is a Wisconsin tourism guru and solopreneur who discovered multiple careers following retirement. I want to thank you for sharing your leadership expertise and Enneagram experiences with us on the Self-Aware Leader podcast, where we talk about leveraging your Enneagram power to support continued leadership success. Best wishes to you, Ruth, as you continue to live your life to the fullest through a can-do mindset and positive outlook on life. Thank you, Linda. It's been a pleasure to be a part of your podcast. And thank you for the Enneagram process. It really has made a world of difference for me. So oh. more success to, every, to everyone who takes on this project. It's great. It really will do great things for you. Thank you. Such a, such a kind, generous uh, response. I appreciate that. And thank you to our podcast audience for tuning in to another episode of the Self-Aware Leader Podcast. We will be back soon with another dynamic guest, ready to hear more stories of successful leaders sharing their experiences of leveraging their Enneagram power to accelerate their leadership success. Until then, I am Linda John host of the Self-Aware Leader Podcast, signing off from the Tucson Radio X studios located in the Stewart Title Company building on Broadway Boulevard in Tucson, Arizona. So long. Join us again on the Business Radio X Network for the Self-Aware Leader Podcast.